just thinking, what is your intention at the end? What, what span do you want to cover? What do you want to span? Yeah, what do you, what do you want to cover under that umbrella? Well, um, my intent is just, just to kind of cover your life and just to learn more about... So you have to start from the beginning. I, I want to go back all the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would have to go back because in order to, to have a perspective... I've got it here. I will, I will it's imagine. leading it. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, what, what do you? What do you? What do it's you start. Lead? We're starting from what? The beginning. Do you know why you were named Romano? Do you know why you were named that? Why I was named Romano? Yeah. I was born in 1932, and at the time, Mussolini, the dictator was in power in Italy. And when I was born, my mother was living in France. Under the suggestion of doctors, she had to take my sister, Vania. She had asthma. And the doctor said if she took a trip in Italy, for example, it would be very uh, beneficial for my sister, asthma, knowing that uh, you know, there were relatives in Italy. But my father never became French. He never naturalized to, to be a French. He had been there a few years. But he was still an still uh, Italian citizen. He was offered a free trip to come to Italy by Mussolini, and mainly because my mother was pregnant almost nine months. So Mussolini knew that I would be born in Italy and he would acquire a new citizen. Yeah, this was the mind of a dictator, you know, to do things like that. My mother, since it, my sister had beneficial reasons to, to be in Italy, she took my sister and me in her womb, you know, and she traveled to Italy by herself in the house of my grandparents, my father's parents. And that's where I was born, during that two months she was there. After 45 days that I was born, she went back to France. And my, that's how my name was Romano, Italian, you know, from Rome. I was born in, uh, in Italy in the house where my father was born, 
because when my mother came to Italy, she stayed in the house of uh, my grandfather. This is the entrance of the, uh, of the this is actually the, the, uh, the place where they store hay for the cows and stuff like that. But look at this, look at this entrance. Huh. I don't know how old it is. And that's you right there, right? Well, and this is, this picture is from, we, we went to Italy in 19, I forgot exactly the year, but these are all relatives, they're all my uncles and look, yeah. it's amazing. And that's the house also where as refugees from from uh, from France, yeah. when at the time everybody got out of France because it was 1941, the uh, the, the Second World War was in full fledged. The Germans. Occupied Italy and France. The young men of the new German Reich welded into a mighty war machine. And my father, being an Italian citizen, there was so much discrimination and, and against Italians because Mussolini made a pact with Hitler against France. So the Frenchmen didn't like Mussolini or didn't like the Italians. So my father decided to go back. And we went back to this house where the grandparents were living, uncles were living there, and all those cousins there the, the, from the four sisters and brothers, uh, they were living there. And it was overwhelming for my mother to live there. She was called the Russian, the Polak, the German, because my mother was not Italian. And she spoke with an accent, you know, she was. And we didn't speak Italian either when we came from France. Anyway, so we moved out in that dungeon, Qualso. The genesis of our family is interesting because if my mother and father didn't meet, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here, no, none of our family would be here. It so happens that my mother, when she was 20, 21, she went to France from, from Poland. By the way, she wasn't Polish, my mother. She was living in a German conclave, like Beckersdorf, the name was. As a matter of fact, if you open that book, you know, on the first page, I think, there is a paper which, which states that she's living Beckersdorf, this is the original paper when she left Pol Poland. From Beckersdorf. There were all Germans in the town. The interesting thing is, as I said before, is how my, my parents got together. She was recruited by a com big company from Paris. They were looking for, for women, I think, for jobs in, in Paris, in a factory. Because, you know, my mother grew up in the peasant's household. Her, her father was married three times. All his wife died. And she had a miserable life between stepsisters, stepbrothers and things and that. And she, 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 was, she was very smart, my mother. And naturally, she wanted to, to go, to, you know, like, like many young people that live in little towns, you know, they want to explore the world, you know. And she, she went to Paris. My father, the same thing. Growing up in a peasant's house, you know, you had cows and stuff like that. 
because many companies from Germany, France or whatever, Africa, that's what free, people from Friuli, all, all over the world, from Moscow down to South Africa, to, to Australia, they are all over the place. And my father did the same thing. They meet in Paris, they get married, and that's how the Bogobello started. It was a tenor, my father, you know, tenor, they, they, they process skins from cows, you know, leather. A very interesting, uh, you know, profession, because they color them, they, you know, there was a lot of treatments, you know, to, to, to make bags and shoes and stuff like that. And the, the, the factory moved down to, to South France, to the Pyrenees. Amazing place. I was supposed to be born there, but my mother took a trip to Italy. And then when she went back to France, my brother was born there, and my sister, Maite, was born there. And we stayed there until 1941. Italy and we lived for about two three months in the in this house you know the, the, the where I was born but too many people too much uh, you know when so many people live in one it's okay for a day or two but then after that you know there is always conflicts you know people who live like peasants in a location and at that time you know, these people didn't have newspaper probably so they remained very ignorant and they feel uncomfortable when somebody, stranger, you know, like, like us, we were like stranger because we spoke, we didn't speak Italian when we came in 1941, we came to Italy. I was nine years old, my sister Varia was uh, 14, my brother was uh, six, and my Maite was one year old. She was born in 1940, Maite. She's in Florida now. So it wasn't possible to, to, to live there. So my mother took any empty space, even a, a cave she would have taken. But uh, so we found a place in Quarso. It's a beautiful little town now, especially. But, but at that time, you know, it was all, it was, I was telling you before, you know, some people that live in those little towns, they, they are very close minded. They look at you, who, who are you? you? You speak a different language, you know. So my mother never liked the people there in, 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 in Friuli. Even though they are wonderful people, so we moved to Kuala, so it, was, it must have been a 300-year-old house falling apart, ceiling, so you could see almost through the, through the roof, through the ceiling, the kitchen. So my father put some paper. He lined the, 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 the ceiling up with paper. Anyway, holes, no electricity, no running water, no bathroom. It was a terrible, uh, but my mother was happy because she, she was with her family, you know, and uh, and uh, and she was happy. And she was not the type to be intimidated by oh, she has so many fights with people, you know. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, kids the bully. They receive bu to be bullied by all other kids. She would come out and, and, and like a tiger, you know, to, to tell them, with her way of speaking, uh, you know, talking Italian, you know, whatever. Yeah. And they were all afraid of her. And then during the war, what we went through is incredible. Because Walsall, where we lived, is located close to Austria, close to Yugoslavia at that time. Now it's Slovenia, on the east. Austria on the, on the north, south is the Adriatic. It's, it's an amazing region, physically, you know. It's, I think it's better than Tuscany, actually. That region, because of the location, was always subject of 
of contention about borders, Austro-Hungarian borders since the 1800s. Simply so that there is a multicultural uh, people. That's where purely uh, people. They are different than, than the rest of Italy. They are average. They are the tallest in Italy. I think they have the most, the most beautiful women. And it was always because of, of the contentious of borders and of occupation. There was always military people. So, in 1941, we had Germans. Prior to that, we had Italians. And the military, when they came, the German uh, army had sub-battalions of Polish people. So they, were, they came, but it was always a, 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 a movement of uh, military. Cossacks, the Cossacks, oh yeah, yeah, with the horses, I'll tell you a story about that too. Uh, so, and my mother spoke German, Polish, Russian. When they came, she was the one that the people, they had problems with, with, with these soldiers. Because also at the time, remember, when the Germans were there especially, the partisans, those that, that were uh, coming out at night and shoot, to shoot Germans, they, they were against the Germans. So they woke up at night and shoot a German here. So, and the Germans, in retaliation, they would come to these towns, they never did anything quite so but I know the nearby towns, and they would try to, to find who was the, the, the one that shot that German soldier last night, for example, you know, whatever, or who, who blew up that uh, the railroad. They had suspicion, they knew that people were quiet, they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell. So they would call all the men from town, line them up side by side and count. One, two, three, four, ten, you come out. Ten, you come out. Every ten, come out. They took him back there and shot him. And then all they took him to, to, uh, to the concentration camps. My father was supposed to be shot one time in a situation like that. They got him, they took him to Udine in a prison. Him, he was the oldest and about 15 younger guys. They were partisans or something, you know. But my father was picked up by mistake because my father didn't participate in any things like that. And my mother used to go down there trying to, to, to plead with the Germans because he spoke German. Nothing, no way. Finally, after a long, I don't know, a week or two, they released him. The following day, we learned that these guys, they were in prison with my father, they were together. They were, they were uh, shot, all of them. They took him behind the cemetery and they shot them, the Germans. So my father, you know, escaped uh, to, be, uh, to be killed. What we went, we, my mother especially, went through during uh, these periods that we were in the war because everybody would call her for, for help because of problems, this and that. There was a lot of things that, you know, you don't, you don't want to remember. There was a fort near Pricesimo, near, near Quazzo there, of ammunition. And it was situated in an old castle. And right before escaping, I think the Germans blew it up. It was a big explosion. The so following day, after days after that, the people went there to look for pieces of metal, you know, something like, like even now people do that. You know, they try to collect metal, copper, from, from uh, the, the remainders of uh, the explosion. We, we, we had a friend, he was 13 years old. He got, he got, he, he, he got home with some, with some gadget, I, I, I didn't see it. And he was trying to hammer it, to, to open it. Anyway, he got killed, exploded, 13 years old. Adilio was his name. Oh, and another time there was shooting from the same location uh, to, to Nimi's. 
which is another town on the other side. And the bullets actually, they flew above our heads to, to, to get there, we could, we could hear them. And one day one was so low, it was a big, it's incredible. I don't know where he ended up, but it was so low, actually the, the tree bent, bent. During this period, there was so much, so much to, 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 to tell, you know, to, to, to remember, but you know, so. But you know, the most sad, I would say, period of, of my life was that period, you know, during the, during the war. I would work to, to, to Udine. And I had to walk about uh, two miles, something like that, to get the, uh, the train, the real train. And one morning, the sun was just coming up. It was still half dark and half. The streets are narrow, you know, unpaved, you know. And there is this body across, across the street. And when I, I approached it, I was alone, walking, you know. That's every day to go to go to to, uh, to school. And this guy. I had seen him the night before in Quarzo, in the, uh, in, the, in the general store, because there was a general store, in fact, where they sell wine, you know, there were tables, people play cards and they drink wine, and also they had the store, you know, it was typical. He's still there. And I saw that guy, he, he was not from the town, no, no, nobody knew him. He was carrying a, a, a bunch of flowers and drinking wine, and showing off that he had a gun inside of all the flowers. So I don't know if the Germans got him. That he was just a guy that I saw dead in the street the next day. You know, to see that people, we were kids. You know, now I see there's something up at the schools. Oh, you gotta get psychiatrists, you know, mm -hmm. to, 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 to. No, we, what we saw, what we, you know, we experienced was, We went to the, to the for example, another thing that we did. This, there is a, the, the Torre, the, the a river near Qualso. A river where the beautiful the Torre is called. And then we are 20 years old, 13 years old. So in the summertime, what do we do? We have nothing to do. Kids, you know, running up. We, know, we were never in the house. Our knees were always with cubs. Cubs, what do you call it? Scabs. Scabs, yeah. yeah. Always, always. Yeah, my mother would, in addition to that, we would get spanks when, you know, when, when she says, what do you do, or whatever. But we would go to the river to swim. We didn't know to swim. We never got up to swim lesson. That's how I learned. Going to the river, deep water. We couldn't go across, so we went across, we dove, that's how I learned how to dive. I was a good diver, I used to jump and dive, and then swim under, under the water to go on the other side. But we, we did things, I could, I could have been killed many times. I remember once I climbed a tree because I loved to dive when I was you know, at that age in water. So I climb on that tree and I sit and I, I dive. There was so much water in there, that's it. I could have broken my neck. You were saying, you know, you grew up in, in times where you were surrounded by, you know, difficulty and uh, adversity, but, but yet your family did stay together. How do you feel your parents did together? Do you feel like they had a good marriage as you were growing up? My mother was the, uh, the uh, guidance. My father was rather meek, you know, and especially during the war. Of course, he lost his job, you know, with the tanner from France, and he was a uh, laborer, you know. So most of the time he, he was out of a job, he didn't have a job. We were the poorest people. We lived near the, the um, bakery, 
right next door where my mother was the uh, the uh, she, she used to wash their floors you know, for a little bread maybe we raised a pig once <laughs> yeah and then we raised a sheep to make wool to make a sweater i mean my sister and my mother they managed to learn how to do this and then they made they made a sweater i remember I used to take that sheep around the, the, the fields outside of town for, for, for the sheep to, 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 to eat grass on a leash, just like, you know, you, you, you will walk your dog. And to look where there is a nice patch of green grass. After winter, you know, the winter grass is beginning to grow and you see the new grass fall, but they are a little bit there, a little bit there. So I would take the sheep right there and bring her there for, <laughs> so she would eat it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's amazing. See, I, I, as I'm talking to you, so many things come back to my mind, you know, that I never think about this stuff. They blew a, 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 a bridge. The partisans again. And some horses got killed in that thing. So, you know, Nobody threw away anything there because, you know, people, especially me, we, you know, I never had a stake, you know, until I was, I don't know what age. So and at that time, somebody got the, 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 the horses and they, they, they butchered them. And so we, we, we had the uh, horse meat, so it was good. We always had, had soldiers in our house, a house. It was a shack. Our kitchen was about 10 by 15, that's the size. And then there was another room, and you know what the floor was? Dirt, packed dirt. But always soldiers, because in order to make a buck, my mother did the wash. Now imagine, do the wash for soldiers, and I remember the smell of some soldiers because, you know, they, they didn't change clothing every day. So these guys, they had some body odor, but it was a special, almost, that when my father, for example, came home from, from work after, he saw a smell almost that you like, get to like, you know. She would wash their clothes, and they were not, you know, just a little bit soiled or whatever, they were really. And we had no running water in the house. We had to carry the water. She, she had a, 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 what do you call it? A, a bucket, yeah, big bucket. You know, it's funny because now that I'm telling you the story, of, I, I can visualize all this. First of all, we had to go in the, you know, in the, in the square where there was a public fountain to take the water and bring it home. So we had a winch in Friulano, it was called. It's a, it's a stick round, and at the end, there's two hooks. So we would hang a pail for water, this big, you know, fill it up, hook it, and carry them home. And do several trips. This was about 100, maybe 200 feet, you know, away. We had a stove, a wooden stove, this, this, this big, this high, and that's what she cooked, you know. But then I think she was warming up the water there. And then using that bucket, but it's incredible. Now, when you think about this, it's like thinking about the Stone Age. That's what, that's what my span of life has been. So, but we, that's where we come from. What do you remember about your grandparents? Not much. First of all, you know, I didn't grow up with my grandparents you know, until the age of nine. That's when I met them. When we arrived from France, we went to live in their house. And shortly after, we moved to Quanso, to, to the dungeon where we lived until 54. And during that period, my mother didn't have too much sympathy for my father's family, my grandparents. They were egoists selfish and I'll tell you why there was a time when we were in quarters as you know we were very poor I told you we lacked everything everything that you need in life we didn't have 
and we have to struggle for everything. So one day, my mother needed some potatoes, and she knew that they had potatoes, they were farmers. They have pilots like this, you know, in the cold, they had a cold room. My mother thought that maybe she could get some potatoes from her in-laws there. So we walked, it's about two miles, to, 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 or even more. You know what? We don't have, we don't give you potatoes. Go, go to, there is an office for assistance someplace, you know, I don't know where. That's what they, they told her. Not one potato. But in those days, it was a great, big, great horror. It used to break my heart when these kids were so hungry. You know, I can't even talk. They were so hungry. And they tried to reach for the grapes. And no look took a human excrement and threw it all over those grapes so they wouldn't touch them. Those damn kids of the damn German woman. The damn kids of the damn German woman. And that's all we want to them. So I think that was the last time that my mother expected anything from them. Yeah. We were always around us kids. As I told you before, you know, we had nothing to do with it. We were always running around, you know. We got another thing that kept us, kept us busy, and really busy, another thing that we did for money. This is the, a miniature sporta, we call it in Italian. And see, this is made from corn husks. But the, the regular ones are this big, used for, to, to carry, carry stuff. And that's what we made. In Friuli, when during the war, you know, to make up some, it's very easy when you know how to do it. Our fingers, you know, because you have, you have to touch them and slide your fingers right. on it. Call us, they are very rough. They are not smooth like paper. So that we have sometimes we have almost blood on our fingers because all the skin wear out. So we use another finger. We, you know. You talk about like things that you did in your spare time. You went to school. As a, when did you you started school? Oh, uh, I started a year early. In France, instead of six, I started at five. What was that experience like for you in school? It was normal. We were in France. We spoke French. We, uh, I never spoke Italian. I have a few memories. I, don't know. I remember in 1999. I went to France with Vania and Maite and Julie. We went to Paris. We drove all the way down to South France, to Sévignac, where, where I grew up, and the school is still there. Now, this is 99. My sister is 73, 74 years old she is. We are walking the street in, in Sevignac, Meirac. This is a French town where we, where, where we grew up. We meet somebody and there is a guy. He looks at her and he says, Tanya, he recognizes her. 60 years later, well, he, he looks like an old man almost, you know. And she is not young. She was 14 years old when she left. I was nine. But it's incredible. The same thing happened to me. I'm in Udine. I go to a bank. I was already 50, maybe, whatever. And there is people sitting there. And there is this guy. He raises his head, he looks. Romano Borgobello. And I have a beard, too, because I had a beard for a very long time. 
it's, but it's incredible. Oh, another one. Oh shit. <laughs> About recognition, this is this is even worse. In Qualso, one evening, my brother and other guys, we decided to go to Nimis, which is a town maybe three miles away, or even less, to go to the movies. Going there, you know, it's a little hilly, up and down, you know. We go there by bike. And there is a little hill going down. And it's dark. I'm driving the bike. My brother is sitting on the, uh, on the, the bar, because we, we, did, we didn't have two bikes. No light. No, no, no. I don't even know if we have brakes, who knows what. Well. So we are down the downhill, dark. I mean, very... We had something. It was this old lady. I mean, pretty, she was pretty old already. Yeah. It's true that at that time, women especially, at 30, they were older, older already, you know. They were dark things, you know, whatever. But this was, was pretty old because she, 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 she lost some teeth, I think, when she fell. We, well, we had her with the bike. I thought we, we killed her. Damn shit, what is what we will do now? <laughs> <laughs> she was okay. Anyway, and after that, you know, we felt sorry, you know, but she was okay, you know, she was. I think that they found a tooth. But she, she had a few teeth anyway, you know, so she lost. <laughs> it was the last one. But what I'm getting to, one year, and this is many, 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 many years, again, I have a big, and I am in Qualso. Standing on the corner of, of the of the of the general store, she walks up around the corner. She turns this way, and there is a few steps to come up. And I, and I thought I recognize her. I said, "Incredible that she's still around." She looks at me. You are the one that had me when to put the bike. That's what she told me. Unbelievable. And I was a kid of 14 years old, maybe at the time, or 15. It's unbelievable. So I could never do anything illegal because I would be recognized even if whatever mask I put on. <laughs> when you went to Qualso, did you go to school when you guys were in? Yeah, school? oh, by the way, look, look at this. If you want to see, yeah. I think here, there is my Amisión a la Escuela Media. Now, you know here you have to go to school until 18. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what it was here? Fifth, fifth grade. No, I, I was. Oh, this is the bulletin of the parish of Qualso. Parochia di Qualso. Oh, this is my first passport. <laughs> See, this is a passport made when I uh, came here. Up to that point, I never needed a passport because I never went anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we arrived in, in Italy during the summer, and school began in September. Like here, I learned Italian and Friulano. Probably in three months. It's incredible, but when you're young, how quick you learn a language. When was your first job? Do you remember your, the first job you ever had? Yeah, my business. I was an apprentice. How old were you? Sixteen. An apprentice for for what? For for, for dental technician. Was that something you had studied in school at no. all? No. Was there a reason that you, you did that? Like, did you just... Because you got to do something. You, 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 you are not going to go to college. Right. How? Oh. At that time, it was to the end of the war. There were bombardments. And uh, we, I remember my father was at no job. And I lost one year of school. That's another reason that you know, things were all upside down. Because I had a pass, the monthly pass for the train to go to Udina and I didn't renew it because we, we had no money. They caught me and that's it, I lost my, I lost my, my pass and we couldn't, we, we, no, 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 you know. So I was home for a while and then we found begging, can you take my son to learn to trade? Because it was an important thing. Because most people there, you know, they, my, that's what my brother did, he went, we went to a brake factory. You have no idea what my brother went through. Because I was lucky that these people took me. 
as an apprentice, to, you know, to do what? To stand there and to lock and to sweep the floor. Romano, go get me that, for, for my cigarettes in there or whatever, you know, for a long while. That's how you learn a trade at that time. And so I was lucky to have this. And then little by little, you know, I, I learned it and I, and that's where I, that's where I, I was, you know, later. My brother didn't have that luck because if he was 16, he went to France as a, what do you call these workers that come from Mexico to California to, to, to work, laborers. That's what he did, my brother, that in the cold weather, no clothing, but no, appro no appropriate clothing. In the winter time, you know, the train that goes from uh, Italy to Austria, it means in the mountains. You know, a lot of snowfalls there. So they recruit the people from Udine, from Qualso, you know, to go there to shovel, to clear the snow from the, uh, the, rail, the, the rails. But the thing is, my father didn't have proper clothing because it gets very cold there. They had little shoes, you know, skimpy. And uh, you know what shovel? A little shovel this big they had. That I think he had to bring his own shovel. But they, this the little shovel that you use now just to, for the garden. And I remember the stories, the way, you know, the cold and, and the, the places where they had to live. And then, in 48, you know, when, when the Americans came, the American army came at the end of the war. They occupied any place they could find, the military, but all of them, not only the Americans, they would take over, you know, even private houses, they would uh, say, oh, this is going to be taken, you know, for the military, and they, you couldn't do anything. The Americans in general, they were the most dis disrespectful with women, that, because we had Cossacks, Germans, Italians, military I'm talking about, they were no problems with, with these people. When the Americans came, what I heard and what I saw, you know, because we were always around the, the military when we were kids. I remember, oh, we were so lucky that we could go there with a, with a, with a container. Do you know what food we took on? We stood outside of the men's hall where the, the, the guys came out to scrape their, their plate in the garbage, we would catch it. And they would scrape it in our thing, and that's what we took home to eat. And this is true. But then, many times, to get there from Quarso, from where we lived, we had to go through fields, you know, in the middle of the fields we walked, but, you know, we, we, we had to walk through pathways in, into the fields in to, to, to go there and to come back. And with trees, this side, this side. You know how many times I heard girls scream, attacked, and then the next day or whatever, you know how many times we saw condoms all over the place? I didn't even know what condom was, you know, we didn't know, we were very innocent. And I heard these girls screaming, I didn't realize the gravity of what was going on. Only later, I, you know, what they did. They give you gum, they, especially the Americans. Oh, they had chocolate. And then they would say, figgy, figgy. They would ask the, ask the guy, the, the, the kids, figgy, figgy, come, choo, choo, go. You know what figgy, figgy meant? They wanted two girls to, to have sex with. So they asked us if we knew a girl. They could, uh, you know, we, but you know what they were asking for. So sometimes it was disgusting what, 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 uh, what I saw. I would see girls looking out the window where the soldiers' living quarters were. They had girls in there. So you can imagine what was going on. The young girls I'm talking about, 13 years old, you know, 14, same as us. It's hmm. incredible, we had all kinds of stuff in there. But not, not part of Italy, I think, experience the diversity of military people that we had. And the Cossacks were very, oh, the Cossacks, I'm telling you, sorry about the Cossacks. <laughs>
Cossacks. They are horsemen. They are from, from Mongolia. And they are great horsemen. So they had plenty of horses, the Mule was saying there. And of course, we are there. We saw when they left. We were there when they arrived, you know. Anytime we, got, we went up to the house, where the hell do we go, you know? <laughs> so, we, especially in, in Cossacks, you know, in military, it's a new thing to watch, you know. We, 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 and whatever. So this day, a, a bunch of Cossacks come returning on their horses, and we were friends with them, you know, the new ones, you know. But and when a horse is sweating, or is you know, it is just you cannot let it cool. You either cover them, or you you you. Uh, cool them down by walking them or whatever. So what do they do, these guys? They, they asked us or whatever, I don't remember how it happened, but they had to pick us up to put us on the horse. Sit on the horse. And they say, walk, walk the horses, no saddle, you know, to cool them down, because they know us, you know. They, they, so in Quarzo there is a loop, maybe almost a mile maybe a little less than mine, but it's, it's a long loop. So, it was me, my brother, we, we walk, walk, on, on, but when we made the turn, they are not seeing us anymore. We, we try to trot them. So we, we walk, boom, 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 boom. These horses are, you know, big, big horses, you know. These damn horses took off and I never been on a horse before. My brother is three or three years younger than me, and going, going, going. But we were enjoying it for a while, you know. And then on the curve, there's a sharp turn. The horse is like this, and we are, they never stopped, you know. And we are, we were gone, <laughs> and then we made the whole loop, and we never fell. Can you believe this? That's uh, that's. <laughs> I was talking to my brother about this the other day. This is amazing. Amazing for We are kids. Yeah. Other than your your immediate family, like your siblings, did you have any very close companions as a kid or as a young adult or Oh yeah, you know, from school friends. We have, we have, we have plenty of good friends. You know, we play soccer all the time. You yeah. know, we, 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 we was 14, 15. But you know, we didn't have a soccer ball like you have now. We had, uh, first of all, no money to buy a soccer ball, especially me. I had friends that. I couldn't believe it one day. He said that he, he has money in the bank. I didn't even know what a bank was. My parents never had a, a, a bank account. Never. Even when they came here, anyway. So I, I didn't have the money for, to buy a soccer ball and neither were my friends. So somebody got, up, got up, an old one. And at the time the ball, the soccer balls were made of leather brown leather, you know, plain leather. But the, the, the pieces of the leather, they were always breaking, you know. And I was always the one to fix it because nobody wanted to, to, to fix it. You know. So I, I, I don't know, I managed to, to keep the ball in good shape. And then there was no soccer field in Qualso. So we had to go in private properties. And sometimes we were chased away, chased away by by this, the honor of, the, of these places, it's incredible. So, you know, I, I was playing games like, like this, and I was always the one to, to gather the guys to, to go play. And we played in the uh, Sunday afternoon, that's it. Saturday was a day just like Monday. Sunday was the only day that you, you, you didn't work. So in the morning on Sunday, we went to mass, you know, church, and then, and then in the afternoon there was Vespers, but we skipped it sometimes, many times, because we went to, to uh, play soccer. Yeah, later on, I did go to Savoniano in another, in another town, where I had a friend, uh, Bruno Venuti, who, who is dead now. And I played with a team there, you know, whatever, you know, it was, 
uh, I had a lot of good friends. And then later on, Silvano, now the poor guy is uh, almost blind, Santa Maraldo, I had a lot of good friends. How do you feel like your life started to change when you moved to America? It was a, a tremendous change. It, it was not easy. thing that I experienced when I came here was the language. Even though I took classes of English, but I was an adult already, so you know, it's a, and I, I didn't take too many. Still, the language, the, the lack of be able, being able to communicate was very uh, non-stimulating, you know, to, to stay. If I didn't have my family here, I would have gone back after three months. I'm going to come back, but as I learn in English, well, first of all, as soon as I got here, from, uh, I took classes in Rockers, this was in the early 60s, and then even after that, when I got married in 1963, and Julie, your grandmother, we took nine classes at Columbia School in Maplewood. Yeah, we continue to speak our language, but we learn English, and I, I, I opened my, my business two years after, no, even, even less that I was here. So I was already able to communicate, you know. So then the change became clear, you know, and, and, and positive, because everything changed. I had some money in my pocket. I bought a car a few months after I was here. Chevy, did you see the picture of the Chevy? Beautiful Chevy Impala yeah. with wings in the back. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to show it to you later. So, you know, I got married three years later that I was here. I paid for the wedding, so can you imagine? I was able to do all this. And then, what else? So, and I bought a house in 65, five years later, you know, plenty. I don't, I don't mean to jump back, um, but how did you and Julie meet? Julie? I know her from Italy. You know, young people there at that time, I think we had better opportunities to meet girls at that time in Italy because 
uh, they, they had places where just for dancing. And, and just for young people, there was no bar and drinking. We went out, we never went out to a party, and the reason was to drink. Oh, what I would drink, but it was not even in the back of our mind to, to, be, to, to imbibe. No. It was to chase girls. That's it. So that's how we met girls. We went to, to these places, in Tarcento, uh, you know, surrounding, surrounding towns. There was always maybe a, a feast going there, and they had a, a band, and they uh, uh, played music, and you could... So, then you sit there, and you see, look, and you look around, you know, you... you, you, you what do you say? You, you uh, like, like, like... Survey the area. Survey, yeah. and plan, <laughs> and yeah. then you're afraid. I was always timid, very timid. So, uh, I didn't have much love with that. But, if you had a chance, then you also put prop that were dance and then you said yes yeah. so sometimes they said no. But if you said yes, so and then you didn't you didn't dance to all these dances they have now. You dance tango, walls, you know, things that sometimes you can squeeze or you know, a little more. Because here now the best of it is you never you never had a chance to grab the girl, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's how really you met girls. It was wonderful. It was so exciting. <laughs> and that's how I met Julie. Yeah. Well, first of all, she was almost local. She was born in Leana also, in the same town I was born. So no, and in small towns like Redana, you know everybody, it's like a big family. And normally, like Quarzo for example, you know everybody. You grow up with all the girls. It's like they are your cousin or your sister, you know. All, all the, so you don't go after these because you, you think they're part of your family. So you go out of town to meet a girl, you know. <laughs> it's true. It's weird, but it's true. So, yeah, I never was friendly with, with a girl in, from Qualso, from me, from the town, from, or Rihanna. Well, Rihanna, Julie was, but, but we moved to Rihanna later, in 54, I think it was. And Julie was very famous for being beautiful in town. Oh, yeah, she was beautiful. That's why look at her daughters. Yeah, all, all three. And uh, so, and then when I came here, no uncertainty, you know, I, I didn't want to make a commitment with her because, you know, we never, I never knew her, so she was free, and she, and she did, she dated in Italy, or you know, she had friends or whatever. I mean, you know, but because I didn't want to, her to be compelled to wait for me, you know, who oh, Romano is there, what I'm gonna do, you know, but because I, 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 when I came here, I didn't even know if I was gonna stay here originally, and then. Uh, then I didn't know, suppose I didn't, I didn't start my own business, my own life, you know, I would be working for somebody and maybe not making a good living, so I wouldn't do that to her, you know. So I, I opened my lab, actually, well, 1962. I had my own business. In 63, then, then I saw that I was doing well, and uh, then I, I, I told her to come over. And 
she came here. And I decided I'm going to marry her. At the end of 62, I think she came in. And we were married the following year, I think it was April. Was that nice? Did you have a lot of people? Not a lot, like now. <laughs> when is there now? I don't remember exactly how many people, but it was just family. Family, a few friends. Nice place, good time. And then we went to... for our honeymoon, Niagara Falls. No GPS, nothing, you know, at the time. And it was amazing. You said that uh, Julia was famous for, for being beautiful. Other than that, what did you admire most about her? Her modesty. Even though she was beautiful, she, she wasn't. Look at me, look at me. She was modest, you know, and uh, she was smart. Still, and, uh, good qualities. You know? mm. She got a diploma here, high school. She was a valedictorian. So you got married in '63, and then you said you had kids. How long after was that? One year. I was 31 when I got married. I was old. I was an old man. She was three years younger. Did you feel like you were ready to be a parent when, when you heard that you were going to have a child? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you name each child the name that you gave them? Don't ask me that. Because I don't... <laughs> Is that all? Was well, that one, one reason, I don't know what Laurie was named Laurie. Because, you know, in, 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 uh, in Italian, you don't have R, you know, the R is R, Lori. So there was a little problem with Julie. That's why the second and third one don't have R's in their name. Lisa and Janet. But Lori, she had problems in calling her name, you know. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, especially. <laughs> In Italian is Laura. Do you remember anything about any of your three children that you found was special or unusual? Yeah, I think I do. What, what, one thing about Lisa. She was always curious. Daddy, why, why, why this? Why the talk, 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 you know, even she could talk, but she was always vociferous about the talking about and the questioning things. Laurie was uh, more afraid of what do we do tomorrow? What do we do next? Looking forward. What do we do? What do we do? She wanted to do something all the time. Janet, Janet, she was, <laughs> I remember, we were living in North Plainfield and your mother was in a playpen. She could stand, you know, in there. She was very plump. <laughs> so, it begins to rain. And everybody goes in. And we forgot her. You know what she was doing? She was, she was happy as a dog, holding on to the train, getting a lot of drops. <laughs> Happy, no, no, <laughs> water, <laughs> they were all that they had all the amazing qualities, you know, that, that, that enjoyable. You know. If you had the ability to, to do it over again, raising a family? 
Do you think he would change anything? No. Nothing was planned, you know. We, we took things as, as they came. We had a beautiful little house where they, they were born. And then at one time, the house, you know, as the kids grew, it became a little too tight, but it was doable. But I could afford it, and so I, I bought this house. In uh, 1974. I had so, so much confidence that things are going to be fine, you know, but... I, I am... Most of the time I'm optimistic. So we, I mean, I have more questions if you want to keep going. After Julie passed, and then you you married Eileen, that must have been a big change, you know, because you went from meeting this girl in your hometown, mm -hmm. all the way in, you know, other side of the world, coming here, and now you're married to an American. Tremendous change, but still a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean, she's a good woman, she's, she's very smart also. So lucky.
time that we get married again. Never. But, uh, but I did. She made me do it. <laughs> What do you think your favorite place in the world is? Good question. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many. Uh, my favorite place, if I had to choose a place, what is it? One of my favorite places to traveling is Pompeii, for example. They're still excavating in Pompeii, you know. But uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't visit many, many favorite, big places in the world. You know, uh, but as far as beauty, to me, the Dolomites, the mountains. It doesn't have to be big skyscrapers, you know, for me to, to I appreciate natural beauties, you know, like nature. If I asked you this, I mean, you, you, you probably wouldn't be able to come up with something right on the spot, but if I were to ask you what was the most memorable moment of your life, if one came to mind, what would you think about? When my... my Three kids were born. That's a miracle of life to me, you know, it's important. Uh, I have many more moments, you know, can take so many. To me, very simple moments are memorable to me. Like being in Hawaii and looking at the sun go down and I never saw the gun that big. It's incredible. I thought I took pictures. I never thought that that, that picture would come out so beautiful. The suns, they, so I mean, see them in magazines sometimes, things like that. Simple things for me are memorable. To be in some, some places where you look at a waterfall. Or, like when we went to Whistler, you know, with Aline uh, and I. We drove up the West Coast. And uh, we saw places and you know the sequoias. You know, the, 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 that, the, those are the things that the, the, the beaches, the, the things that, that to me are memorable moments. That's sort of, I am in awe, you know, that, that, when I see things like that. Or Capri, you know, when we, I went with Julie with Capri. Those are all visual things that I remember. You know. Memorable. Listen to, 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 to music, for example, you know, beautiful 
music to me is a being an essential part of my uh, joy. Beethoven's Night, it's amazing. Because Beethoven's music is not melodic. Do you know simple Schubert symphonies? Mm. Melodic, beautiful. Right. When you hear those phrases, you know, so beautiful, pleasant, it's like watching a girl dancing out, or whatever. Beethoven, you don't have that in Beethoven, very seldom, you know, uh, there is a line, but when you listen to Beethoven's music, it's like a sense, that of a feeling that you get, and it's sensual almost, you know. Like, the, the, uh, is the second movement of the seventh. Same note, repeat. <coughs> My daughter Lisa said that it's, it's her, her favorite symphony of Beethoven, the seventh. But the second movement is like this. It goes like this. And of course, then it develops into different things. But just this, it's a premonition, something is coming. What do you think was the most stressful experience of your entire life? I have a fear of drowning. <laughs> I don't know, but stressful. But you mean if I think of something and it stresses me, I can think of one. I'm thinking about when, when was I really scared. One evening, we're coming home from Italy on a plane, 747. We are landing, and as as you know, I don't know if you know, but I love to fly. And that's why, contrary to what many people don't want to do, I like to sit by window. People don't want to sit by window because they want to be ready to escape. I don't even think about that. But I love to love. So I am aware from the time the plane takes off, I like to always love to look outside and, and, and feel the takeoff and feel going up, you know, and the velocity. But so we are landing, and again, it's, this is night, it's dark, and I know we're landing, oh, and I see all the lights, you know, New York and things, and I see the lights coming close and close and close and close on the landing, and I can feel that the wheels going down, and then when the big flaps come off, and it's such a good feeling, you know, you see, I can feel the plane slowing down, and you know, so. We are on the 747, ready to land. We are almost touching down. The engines rave like crazy. And it picks up speed and it goes up. They scare me to death. And then, but I think we learn that it, there, there was another plane on the, on the runway, and, and, and the pilot fortunately saw it, and they had to take off in order not to avoid hitting the plane. So now, we are sitting on this plane, up, it goes up and up and up again. This plane now is not supposed to be up here. And looking at the um, stewardess, they were sitting, they were, I could see them. They, they, they got white in their faces, and they, but they were looking at each other, what the hell is going on? Oh, we were up in the air for... 15 20 minutes, you know, before the plane landed there. Anyway, that's that's the time that I was really uh, consciously scared. But other than that, I can't remember in my life, you know, I, I, even in times of uh, seemingly danger or whatever, I, I, I don't know why, but I tend to remain calm, you know.
I don't like this side. Even when this happened, you know, my my heart. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? About what happened? If this happened someplace else, even at home, I would I wouldn't be here, I'll be I'll be dead. I was sitting there and when well, you're gonna cut your arrest, it means that you, you it's not a heart uh, uh, attack, a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is simply that a healthy heart stops because the electrical uh, s signals, they, they get mixed up. When your heart stops, you're done. If you don't get help within three minutes, then, or if, if you get help after three minutes, you might survive but you might get damage, damage in, in, in your mind, you know, on your, on your brain. And, and I dropped. Everybody asked me, what did you feel, you know? Because usually, you know, a heart attack, for example, you feel that something is happening, you know, mm -hmm. pain here or whatever. I'm, you know, watch it again. It's like a, this, boom, that's it. Just the, the, like a light being switched off. So I don't remember nothing. Unfortunately, right next to Janet and Ross, there was this guy, a male nurse from uh, Robert Wood uh, Hospital and a um, female nurse also that had just completed a, a, a course in, in the CPR and they went to work right away on me to give me CPR and keeping my heart pumping. And then another guy from across the field, he was the father of the opposing team, came over and uh, because it's a very, uh, hard thing to do for a long time and unfortunately you know unfortunately uh, I don't know why the ambulance didn't come for, for, until after 10 minutes that this happened and the police came and then they put the defibrillator they brought, brought me back And uh, then it took me to a hospital. But the first time I opened my eyes after that is when I was in the, uh, I think, in the ambulance. I opened my eyes and I saw Janet looking mm -hmm. down because Janet was at the game also. Dad, you had a heart attack. You know that's what she said. And of course I was, you know, still. Then I closed my eyes again and then. I, but anyway, this. Uh, that's what I. Unfortunately. These three people saved my life, you know. So we had a proclamation, did you know about it? At the uh, Isboro Town Hall? I was there, yeah. Oh, that's right, you I were there. there. Yeah. It was very nice. So these three people were recognized for what they did in town, in the, in the town of uh, Isboro. And they deserved it because it's amazing. Even, I don't know if, if, if when you do CPR, there is a hundred percent certainty that you're going to be fine. I don't think so. And you know, when I was in the hospital, because you can, you can get the damage to your brain. So I am in the hospital after this, shortly after, what, the following day, I think, or two days later, and I see these people giving me the third degree questionnaire, you know, all the time. And I didn't realize, now I know why. I didn't know why. What is your name? Where, where do you live? How old are you? Questions, you know, that they were testing my, my memory. They were testing my brain if I was uh, clear. 
<laughs> I kept asking, what are you asking all that? Don't, don't throw in my papers there. But fortunately, I uh, I didn't get to receive, get any damage, you know, on my... In, as a matter of fact, I, I, I think my mind is more clear now than, than before. No, I mean it. It's, it's, it's a... Get lucky. Yeah, the, the, I'm actually almost done here. Um, I mean, I guess I would ask you, you know, you have so many grandkids, you have great-grandchildren now. Don't ask me which one is the best. <laughs> No, no, no. Which no, one you like better? Your right <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I would just ask, you know, if you could give any advice to them, you know, these kids that are growing up, what would you give them? First of all, to be honest, and. Uh, um, before expressing an opinion, think ten times about it. Ten times, you know. Think about it. Don't make, don't make, don't make yourself a fool. I think I don't know, yeah, you know. I have to think about that. You know, I think so many things that probably you, you guys know already more than I do about, you know, life or whatever. But. I think one one of the important things is to be happy with what you have, even when you have nothing. And not to to rush for things that you cannot get. And be happy with the little don't don't envy all the people that they have more than because that's not happiness. There's so many little things that can make, that make people happy. Little things.
you feel? Do you feel? Do you feel better? Oh, I feel so empty. Yeah, you feel like you've <laughs> emptied yourself. I'm um, exhausted. Yeah, you're tired. I mean, we've been sitting here for three hours almost. Really? Yeah, I had to go Tell you, time. Time flies. Time flies. Yeah.